Good evening, everyone. My name is James Green. I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative at Brown University and a professor of history and Portuguese and Brazilian studies. And this event is sponsored by uh, the Brazil Initiative, which is uh, an interdisciplinary effort to bring together scholars and students working in and on Brazil across the university campus. And before I introduce our evening's event and our speakers, I'd like to call on Ramon Stern, who's the program administrator of the Brazil Initiative, who organizes this event and organizes this activity to make a short announcement. Ramon. He deserves an applause for everything he does. <laughs> Um, thank you, Jim. Um, I don't know how many of you picked up uh, or already have the calendar for events for this semester, but it's, it's really full of amazing events. I just want to, um, next, next week, October 4th and October 6th, so Tuesday and Thursday, we have two talks. One is about racial inclusion in, in Brazil in, in higher education by Marcia Lima, um, who's an Afro-Latin American Research Institute fellow at Harvard, and um, is coming from, from Ushbi. Um, and then on, on Thursday, we have Kwame Dixon, who's, I believe, a political scientist. He's in African American studies, and he's going to be looking at Afropolitics and civil society in Salvador da Bahia, Brazil. So um, we have a lot of programming this semester. Um, thanks to our collaboration with Africana Studies, um, we, we've really um, heightened our programming related to Afro-Brazil, um, have some very interesting events also related to indigenous questions, um, and also migration. Um, so if you haven't picked up the um, calendar, there are copies of it outside after the event for you to pick up. And if you're not on the Br Brazil events list and you want to be, you can just shoot me your email over to brazil at brown.edu. That's brazil at brown.edu. Okay? Thank you very much. So as I mentioned, the Brazil Initiative is an interdisciplinary effort to bring together scholars from the humanities, social sciences, and sciences who teach about Brazil and or do research uh, in Brazil. Our programming is designed to educate the Brown community about the political, social, economic, and cultural complexities of Brazil through bringing to campus leading scholars across the disciplines for events such as tonight's panel. Brazilian democracy and the aftermath of impeachment. The Brazil Initiative seeks to bring these diverse ideas and perspectives uh, in, that reach across also the political perspective uh, spectrum in Brazil and that reflect different interpretations of scholars who do research on the country. We are nonpartisan and encourage an open and democratic debate on these issues facing Brazil at this moment. Now, as many of you know, in April 2016, the Brazilian lower house, the Câmara de Deputados, voted to impeach Dilma Rousseff for crimes of responsibility related to budgeting and payment of government subsidies for the agricultural sector. Her case was brought before the Senate in August 2016, and she was removed from August on August 31st, uh, 2016, although she did not lose her political rights. In May 2016, the Executive Committee of the Latin American Association, Studies Association, LASA, the largest interdisciplinary international organization of scholars working on Latin America and the Caribbean, passed the following resolution, and I'm going to quote it. Whereas, the arbitrary and causistic manner in which the impeachment process is being carried out against President Dilma Rousseff constitutes an attack against Brazilian democracy, Whereas democracy is an indispensable condition for attaining a dignified and socially just future for all of the region's inhabitants, and whereas the international community of Latin Americanists has long stood in solidarity with the struggles in defense of democracy, be it resolved that LASA denounces the current impeachment process as anti-democratic and encourages its members to call the world's attention to the dangerous precedents that this process establishes for the entire region. Now, this resolution was then sent out to the membership to vote on whether or not they would agree or disagree with the resolution, as is a tradition within LASA. Joanne Rapoport, an anthropologist and the president of LASA, also appointed a delegation of five experts in Latin America, including two our panelists tonight, who were given the task of traveling to Brazil on a fact-finding tour to investigate the impeachment process and issue a report of its findings. 
In August, on August 9th, 2016, Lhasa announced the results of the ratification process of the resolution that had been approved by the uh, Executive Committee. And at that time, there were 7,457 individual members of Lhasa, 2,589, or 35% of the membership, voted on the resolution. In favor were 2,263, or 87% of the voting members, against were 326, or 13%. So that's part of the background of why we've organized this event tonight, to allow two of the members of that delegation to talk about their experiences in Brazil. We are especially honored to have Sidney Shalubi and Keisha Khan Perry with us tonight to talk about their <coughs> experiences in the investigation process um, and its implications for Brazil. And I will briefly introduce them, and then after their presentations, we'll have ample time for uh, discussions. And for those who are coming in late, there's a, an honorary seat which is reserved for a 90 de Janeiro here, <laughs> right here, right here in the front. <laughs> applaud his arrival, right here, right. <laughs> we were waiting for him. We were. I was just holding off so as much as possible. Right here, on Nani. <laughs> yeah, for you. <laughs> so Sidney Shalubi is professor of Brazilian history at Harvard University and was the head of the Lhasa delegation to Brazil. Before moving to Harvard in July 2015, he taught history at the University of Campinas, Brazil for 30 years. He has published three books on the social history of 19th and early 20th century Rio de Janeiro and a wonderful book on Machado de Assis that examines the literature and political ideas of the most important 19th century Brazilian novelist. He has also co-edited five other books on the social history of Brazil and his most recent monograph is on illegal enslavement and the precarious, uh, precariousness of freedom in 19th century Brazil. And I could go on and on. His CV is just amazing. <laughs> and in addition to being a prolific scholar, he is generally a nice person. <laughs> We're really lucky to have him as a neighbor. And I hope Sidney feels that Brown is his second home in the United States. We want to welcome him anytime he wants to join us for an event. Keisha Khan Perry, we're very honored to have as one of our own. She is an associate professor of Africana Studies at Brown University and specializes in the critical study of race, gender, and politics in the Americas with a particular focus on black women's activism, urban geography, and questions of citizenship, feminist theories, intellectual history, and disciplinary formations, as well as the interrelationship between scholarship, pedagogy, and political engagement. She has conducted extensive research in Mexico, Jamaica, Belize, Brazil, Argentina, and in the United States. She recently completed the book Black Women Against the Land Grab, The Fight for Racial Justice in Brazil, which is an ethnographic study of black women's activism in Brazilian cities. She is currently writing Anthropology for Liberation, Research Writing and Teaching for Social Justice, while working on two other research projects. And again, I could go on on her accomplishments, which are many. She is an energetic, prolific, and engaged scholar, and also a very wonderful person <laughs> who has helped shape the direction and the priorities of the Brazil Initiative. Let us give them both uh, a round of applause. <laughs> so in tonight's event, uh, Sydney and uh, Keisha Khan will speak approximately 25 minutes each, 25, 30 minutes each. And then we're going to open it for a debate. So we'll have about an hour for a discussion and debate. We'll have take two or three questions at a time and have this conversation with them about the situation. So I'm going to first call on uh, Sydney Shalhoub. So uh, thank you, Jim. I, I will speak from here, if you don't mind. I don't know if I, um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Jim, for, and, uh, for Brown University for putting this together. Um, I, I think it's a um, real challenge to be speaking about this. Um, uh, the first thing I must say is that um, Kisha Khan and I are here today uh, to give basically what is our individual um, view of events in Brazil. Um, the LASA 
uh, report is still uh, underway. My entire responsibility, because it's taken me a long time to figure out <laughs> all these things and, 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 uh, and organize the report. Um, and because this is not an official, uh, there's no way of presenting the official report because it, it's still in process. We are today speaking about our own individual views of what happened in Brazil. Uh, of course, uh, this view is very much shaped in my case, I'm sure Kisha Khan's case too, by the uh, uh, very incredible experience we had in Brazil in July, uh, interviewing uh, 29 uh, people, uh, politicians, scholars, journalists, um, leaders of social movements, uh, giving their, their view about, about uh, the events. Uh, let me just make uh, two observations before I, 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 I continue. First of all, um, just completing the information that um, uh, Jim gave, it is very important to, know, to notice that um, uh, since LASA implemented this new resolution process, uh, which requires that at least 20% of the membership must vote for a, for a decision on a resolution to be considered valid. Uh, almost no resolutions passed because they did not achieve the 20% vote. So the, the, uh, the uh, 35 percent turnout in the Brazilian resolution is really a, a, a very a very high uh, and shows how uh, the members were mobilized in uh, around this issue, and the, the verdict of the LASA members at 87 percent supporting a very strong resolution against um, uh, the impeachment in Brazil is, for that matter, uh, for that reason, very, very significant. And the reason I say that is because my own view of this process is that the resolution uh, expresses very well what I think happened in Brazil. I think. Uh, the impeachment in Brazil is, was indeed an attack against Brazilian democracy, as the resolution says, and it must be denounced as having been conducted in arbitrary and casuistic manner. And what I, what I intend to do uh, uh, is to show um, why this is so, because, well, during, during the impeachment process for several times, um, um, the defense of Dilma Rousseff, especially the, the, the main lawyers, Eduardo Cardoso, said several times that uh, people in favor of the impeachment kept talking about what we called in Portuguese the conjunto da obra. Dilma should be impeached because of the conjunto da obra, of the, you know, actually uh, uh, avoiding the, 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 the real question, which was the complete lack of legal basis for, the, for impeachment. And, um, well, my point is that this is a very serious coup d'etat. doesn't even need an adjective, parliamentary or whatever. It's a coup d'etat, period. Uh, basically because of the conjunto d'obre. Uh, we translation? cannot translate this, but... Uh, the, the but uh, array of her actions. Yes. Her actions as a whole. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yes. And, and this is what makes it really a, a coup d'etat. It's the conjunto d'obre. And what, I, what we are trying to do is actually today is to show uh, how the several interconnected aspects of the case make it a coup d'etat without the need of any adjective, right? Parliamentary or judiciary or whatever you call it, it's just a coup d'etat period. Um, what I, what I, uh, my part here today, we have kind of combined what we're gonna do, is to provide kind of a, a, um, uh, a report of the events um, most of you have been following the, the, uh, the case, know the events I've been talking about, but when you put all of them together in a narrative, it shows what a, what a, what a, uh, the seriousness of the whole process. And, um, and the narrative is based on what we heard in the intervals. I listened to, the, to these intervals during the, these two weeks there, I listened to them again, and I think um, they point to generally to the same aspects. And these are the aspects I'm going to highlight in the narration of the events I'm going to present. 
So ask you to present their views on the causes of the, of the political crisis in Brazil. Interview we tended to start their account, either referring to the political manifestations that had taken place in June 2013, or to the contested 2014 electoral campaign and its immediate aftermath. This was a, a general trend. The popular mobilizations of June 2013 initiated in Sao Paulo as a protest against public transportation fare hikes, led by a social movement called Movimento Passe Livre, Free Fare Movement, which existed since the mid-2000s and defended the idea that public transportation should be conceived of as means to guarantee urban mobility, thus constituting a basic social right. After episodes of police repression, June 13, 2013 was a turning point, and through the systematic use of social media to mobilize protesters, the manifestations grew in the following days and weeks, both in numbers and in the complexity of its constituency and demands. On the one hand, there were those demanding that the government expand and improve basic social services, such as health and education, besides the issues pertaining to urban mobility. On the other hand, there emerged a strong challenge to President Rousseff's government and the Workers' Party rule itself, with questioning of government spending priorities such as the World Cup and the Olympics, also associated with denunciation of corruption linked to these endeavors. As the protests turned against the Workers' Party, the corporate media began to give them extended coverage, effectively supporting their growth. The meanings and the relevance of the protests of June 2013 to the subsequent political process in Brazil are contested territory. And it seems to me that the events need to be studied in a lot more detail before we achieve a better grasp uh, of what happened. However, for the purposes of this presentation, it may be safe to say that they had two lasting consequences. First, as the protests moved away from the organization and the agenda of existing social movements, especially the free fair movement that had initiated them, they acquired a strong anti-corruption tone, tending to be hostile to political parties in general, especially the ruling workers party, and bringing back to the streets a huge number of the conservative predominantly white and economically privileged middle classes that had been away from the open political arena since their support of the military coup in the early 1960s. Second, President Dilma Rousseff's popularity plunged dramatically in the following weeks since the government failed to respond adequately to the demonstrators' grievances, seemingly perplexed by the intensity of the manifestations and the diversity of demands and constituencies which took part in them. President Rousseff would never regain the level of popularity she had enjoyed at the beginning of her first term, and issues such as the expenditures pertaining to preparations for the World Cup and the corruption supposedly associated with them remained volatile issues, prompting manifestations, hateful language in social media, and intense scrutiny by a hostile mainstream press. The divisive and hotly contested presidential election of 2014 is seen by virtually all interviewees as a turning point, somewhat the beginning of the political crisis that has not yet gone away as we write this report, or as I give this presentation. In many ways, the electoral campaign, especially its second round, seemed to evolve as symbolic class warfare with strong racial overtones. As interviewees belonging to the black and feminist movements did not fail to remark, the center-right electoral coalition led by Asio Neves, although promising to keep the main social programs put in place by the Workers' Party government, welcomed the support of social sectors which thought such programs lured and educated voters with both a family encouraging idleness among the poor and affirmative action policies regarding admission to public universities undermining supposedly universalistic meritocratic principles. The campaign was further polarized by the findings of the Lava Jato car wash operation, which unearthed corruption schemes associated with the state-owned oil company Petrobras. However important the findings, 
Judge Sergio Moro's open contention that the success of his investigations depended on the support of public opinion led to many misgivings regarding his intentions. And this showed very clearly in the interviews as well. The Workers' Party and independent media outlets, as well as several of the people interviewed by the Lhasa delegation, notice what appeared to be Moro's cautiously timed and selective feeding of information to the press during the electoral campaign and beyond, mainly concerning the alleged corruption practices of politicians associated with the government coalition. Furthermore, there was concern that Judge Moro's aggressive methods with long arrests of suspects, thus pressuring them to sign plea bargains. There was, there was concern with this. Jurema Vernecki, one of uh, an experienced militant of the black feminist movement who gave us a wonderful interval, observed that Judge Moro treats his suspects in ways that seem similar to those the urban police in Brazil use to deal with poor blacks on a daily basis. That is, the presumption of guilt allows for questionable conduct regarding respect for individual rights. It should be noticed, nevertheless, that those who agree with the conditions of the plea bargain receive punishments that many see as akin to impunity. In any case, as the continuing Lava Jato investigation then showed and continues to show, the importance of the operation lies much beyond the alleged political preferences and controversial methods of Judge Moru, but in his unearthing of the systematic corruption schemes involving some of the most important business concerns in the country and all major political parties. However contested the campaign, the 2014 elections yielded clear, uncontroversial results. Rousseff of the Workers' Party obtained 54,500,000 votes, or 51.64%, and Aécio Neves of PSD, PSDB, Brazilian Social Democratic Party, obtained 51,041,000 votes, or 48.36%. Rousseff received 3,459,000 votes more than her opponent, or 3.28% more. Just as a point of comparison, Obama's victory against Mitt Romney in the popular vote in 2012 was 51.9% against 48.1%, a margin of 3.8%, just a half point percent point, uh, percentage point more. Nonetheless, four days after the election, on October 30th, the defeated party filed a petition with the higher electoral court requesting that its, uh, its legal team be authorized to audit the electoral results, alleging that there appeared in social media uh, denunciations and doubts about the accuracy of the results. A year later, after having examined the documents made available to the, uh, by the TSE, the, the Higher Electoral Court, the PSDB concluded that, quote, there was no fraud in the electoral process. In December 2014, the PSDB had taken another initiative to contest the legitimacy of the vote, filing with the TSE a petition to revoke the registry of the candidacies of President Rousseff and Vice President Temer, alleging, quote, abuse of political and economic power during the electoral campaign, unquote. A final decision on this petition is still pending. Interviewees seemed unanimous to attribute much of the political crisis that led to the impeachment process to the deterioration of the relations between uh, the executive and the legislative branches beginning in 2015 or earlier. Alleged causes for the problem were various, but they may perhaps be addressed as consistent of two kinds. On the one hand, there was frequent mention to a more structural cause pertaining to a political system which demands broad coalitions to guarantee governability. With more than 30 parties represented in a parliament, forming a governing coalition necessarily means having to deal with the petty, often corrupt interests of an ideologically broad range of political parties, large and small, which are ever ready to exchange votes for government posts, financial resources for special interest projects, and other advantages of various kinds. Second, why are presidential elections in Brazil are highly ideological? with the population having the opportunity of knowing and comparing different social policy proposals and their justification, parliamentary elections are the exact opposite. 
In parliamentary elections, votes are cast for a variety of more or less circumstantial, more or less legit legitimate reasons, such as yielding to the influence of evangelical churches, seeking to elect a given member of the community to the legislative, adhering to candidates supported by neighbor associations and other types of organizations, supporting an orthodox candidacy who mock the system, um, thus inviting citizens to protest by voting for them, and so on. In the 2014 parliamentary elections, voters sent to Brasilia what many observers see as the most conservative body of lawmakers in the country's recent history. According to our interviewees, these problems with the way the legislative is run and their political consequences seemed epitomized in the figure of Congressman Eduardo Cunha, the president of the Chamber of Deputies who led the impeachment process against Rousseff. Eduardo Cunha, whose popularity in the state of Rio seems to have originated in his radio shows, often run with a religiously conservative evangelical zeal, had been a federal deputy since 2003 and was elected president of the Federal Chamber in February 2015. Despite being a member of the PMDB, a party of the Brazilian Democratic Movement, formerly part of Rousseff's governing coalition and the party of Vice President Temer, Eduardo Cunha challenged and defeated the Workers' Party candidate, Arnindo Quinagli, among others, to become the chamber's president. On March 3rd, 2015, just a month after his rise to power in the chamber, Cunha learned that his name had been included in a list of politicians who were under investigation by the public prosecutor of the Republic, Rodrigo Janot, in connection with Lava Jato or the car wash operation. Frustrated, perhaps, that the executive had not been taking measures to thwart the investigations, Cunha began to antagonize the government of President Rousseff more openly. On May 27, 2015, he received representatives of social movements campaigning for the impeachment, took pictures with them, and deputies belonging to opposition parties, including lesser figures of the PSDB. But news coverage at the time indicated that the main cardinals of the party, such as uh, former President Fernando Henrique Cardoso and José Serra were still hesitant to support the procedure to oust President Rousseff. Lava Jato investigations proceeded and encompassed an increasing number of congressmen. The Public Prosecutor's Office ordered that the federal police conduct searches and apprehend personal documents of several politicians, including senators. The breakthrough regarding Cunha came in the middle of July 2015 when a deponent associated with one of the firms involved in the corrupt scheme of Petrobras said that he had aggressively demanded bribes worth $5 million. It appears that he had originally demanded $10 million. Cunha's immediate response on July 17 was to announce his definitive rupture with Rousseff's government, declaring that thereafter he formally joined the opposition. Furthermore, he accused Rousseff's government of plotting the accusations against him in combination with the public prosecutor's office, a clue to which nobody seems to have given any credence. In the same interview on which he announced his rupture with the government, Cunha issued a number of threats against it, such as the possible opening of parliamentary inquiry commissions about subjects set, uh, which he alleged could cause embarrassment to the executive and to expedite the appreciation by the chamber of the government's accounting reports for the previous fiscal year, supposedly problematic according to preliminary reports of the Federal Audit Court. Last but not least, he threatened to accept the petition for the opening of impeachment procedures against President Rousseff, which had been presented to him on May 27 by rightist social movements and representatives of opposition parties. In the following months, as several interviewees observed, Cunha sought to blackmail Rousseff's government on a number of issues, implying that he would consider opening impeachment procedures against the president if the investigations against him in the realm of Lava Jato were not somehow obstructed. In her long interview with us, President Rousseff said that one of her main troubles was that she refused to negotiate with Cunha under the conditions that he sought to impose. During the following months, the president of the chamber used his enormous influence among peers to put forward what became known as Pauta Bomba. Bomb docket? <laughs> um, that is, bills proposed by legislative which aimed at increasing government expenditures thus make it impossible for the government to pursue the policies it deemed necessary to fight the deepening economic crisis. For example, there was a bill vetoed by President Rousseff 
proposing a rise of up to 78% in the salaries of the judiciary. With the government increasingly immobilized by the leadership of Cunha in the chamber and popular, mostly white middle class pressure coming from the streets, actively supported by the corporate media and apparently financed by opposition parties, the cardinals of the PSDB seem to finally adhere wholeheartedly to the idea of impeaching a president, thus seeking to reverse their defeat in 2014 presidential elections, the fourth consecutive one to the Workers' Party since 2002. Following new protests that had taken place on August 2015, lawyers associated with and or hired by the PSDB with the support of other opposition parties filed an impeachment petition with the Chamber of Deputies on September 16, 2015. The following steps suggest a collaboration involving the authors of the petition, congressmen belonging to opposition parties, and Eduardo Cunha himself, president of the chamber and in charge of deciding whether the petition would be accepted and thus considered by the chamber. Cunha indicates that in an impeachment petition against President Dilma could not be accepted if it were based on supposed crimes of responsibility that had taken place in her previous tenure as president, 2011 to 2014. He had previously justified not accepting impeachment petitions for this reason. It would contradict Article 86 of the Constitution. A couple of weeks later, October 15th, the lawyers hired by PSDB presented another petition which made reference to facts occurred in 2015, clearly following the lead gave by Cunha. As the Lava Jato investigation continued, there appeared strong evidence that Cunha and members of his family were indeed the beneficiaries of secret bank accounts abroad, that he had lied when denying the existence of such bank accounts, thus making it difficult for the proponents of the impeachment to defend him publicly. Cunha struggled to avoid the opening of proceedings in the chamber seeking to deprive him of his parliamentary post in order to obtain the necessary votes to avoid the approval of the proceedings in the Ethical Council of the Chamber of Deputies, Cunha desperately needed the vote of the three Workers' Party deputies there. As even the Brazilian corporate press informed, Cunha said that he would agree to open impeachment procedures against Dilma if the Workers' Party members in the Ethical Council did not vote in his favor there. On December 2, 2015, the three Workers' Party deputies in the Chamber's Ethical Council announced that he would vote for the opening of procedures against Cunha. On the very same day, Cunha accepted in part the petition, uh, thus initiating impeachment procedures against President Dilma. Even one of the lawyers working for the PSDB, Miguel Reale Jr., commented that Cunha had, what Cunha had done was explicitly back blackmailing. It is important to notice that Cunha accepted the petition only in so far as it addressed supposed irregularities that had taken place in 2015. Six decrees enacted without the allegedly required congressional authorization and the so-called pedaladas, which were said to be illegal credit operations between the executive and public banks. That is to say, the contention that Dilma had to be ousted because the government had supposedly manipulated information regarding the public deficit in order to obtain advantage during the 2014 electoral campaign was never a subject legally under consideration during the impeachment case. The next event seen as a turning point in the interview was, was Lula's one-day arrest in March 2016, followed by the illegal wiring of the conversation between former President Lula and President Dilma about Lula's possible appointment as minister. Moro's attitude to divulge to the press the contents of a conversation he had obtained illegally. He later apologized to a judge of the Supreme Court about having committed this serious illegality, but it seems that there will be no disciplinary measure against him on the case. The use of the episode by the corporate media to increase the support of the impeachment uh, among, uh, among population was enormous. Contrary to Moro, who is not responding legally for his possible crime, Dilma and Lula are being prosecuted for attempting to obstruct justice. Another subject addressed, and I'm almost finishing, uh, this narrative. Um, another subject addressed by several interviewees was the conduct of Vice President Michel Temer, first plotting to have the impeachment petition approved in the plenary of the Chamber of Deputies, and later, after President Dumas' temporary suspension from office, acting during his interim term as president, as if he were already the president. 
Some interviewees called Vice President Temer's conduct a coup inside the, a coup inside the coup. There were two main problems identified in the vice president's conduct. First, posturing as if you were going to become president permanent, permanently after President Rousseff's temporary suspension from office, he made available for bargaining hundreds of public jobs from ministerial posts to leading roles in public banks and companies and so forth that he immediately began to use in exchange for votes in favor of opening impeachment procedures in the chamber. Second, although his party, the PMDB, had been part of the coalition which elected President Rousseff to pursue the social policies presented to the population during the electoral campaign, as soon as he took power, Vice President Temer adopted a series of measures which showed a radical right-wing turn in government priorities and actions. It is obviously not the objective of the institution of the impeachment. I believe Kisha Khan will develop this theme in some detail in a few minutes. Now, I would, stop, I would continue this narrative. Of course, then there are many other things. I mean, the, the conjunto da obra is really huge. I mean, it's incredibly huge. Right after the, uh, Romero Juca became uh, minister, there was this uh, well-publicized event in which he confessed that uh, Dilma had to be brought down because uh, something was needed to stop the, uh, the investi investigation about corruptions. I just need to make one, la one last point because I think this is very important, which is uh, regards, and there's, a, there's also this uh, Senator uh, Asir Gurkak's wonderful saying, which I got from an article that Jim wrote, uh, is uh, coming out of the chamber uh, of the Senate after voting for the impeachment, he says, we were convinced that there was no crime of responsibility in the trial but there was a lack of governability, and the return of the president at this time could cause greater trouble for the Brazilian economy, unquote. This is a confession that the charges against President Dilma did not meet the constitutional standard for impeachment by someone who voted to impeach her. Earlier in June, Senator Rosi de Freitas, leader of the interim government, had said in a radio interview that there was no fiscal pedaladas. The government fell for different reasons. She proceeded to say that, quote, I studied this. I belong to the Budget Commission. What happened was a country which was paralyzed with no direction, and so on, thus emphasizing that solely political motives explain the procedure to oust the president. Um, well, I'll skip this and then go just uh, because I think there's so much confusion about the legal aspect of it, which I want to say um, a couple things about it. Um, so why there was no legal reason for impeachment? The decrees which uh, the government had issued, which supposedly required the authorization of the Congress, there were six decrees, um, actually to think that they depended on authorization of the Congress is a question of interpretation. As the brilliant Dumas defense showed uh, very clearly, Given the worsening of the economic situation, the government had sent to the chamber a request to change officially the annual estimation of the federal deficit in the fiscal year of 2015. This had been a regular procedure in previous governments, and a similar request by Temer's interim government was decided upon by the chamber in a few days. Mm -hmm. However, the request sent by President Dilma in July 2015 was not examined and approved by the chamber until mid-December 2015, five months later. Waiting for the chamber's deliberation would mean in practice a shutdown of the government. Furthermore, the decrees issued by the government without authorization were mostly budgetary adaptations which had no impact on the annual deficit, especially the one finally approved by the chamber in December. It involved a very small, uh, percentage of the annual budget. In other words, the chamber, led by Eduardo Cunha, acted purposefully to push the executive to a state of formal economic paralysis, then recognized that the change in the targeted annual fiscal deficit made sense, thus approved it. However, it continued to sustain in the impeachment procedures that its delay to act regarding the request sent by the government in July 2015 justified impeaching the president for fiscal responsibility. 
the accusation argued that the decrees were issued before the change in the estimated deficit for the year was approved. But then it had postponed approval, the chamber had postponed approval unreasonably and in sharp contrast to normal practice just to cause trouble for the executive. The whole thing suggests outright manipulation and it's no, it is no surprise that it did not seem convincing to so many people, even some of those who voted for impeaching a president. It is another matter to try to understand the reasons why this fact did not deter these people from doing so, from voting for impeachment. Regarding the pedaladas, the situation was even worse. The Constitution required that crimes of responsibility to be typified, demanded the actual participation of the president in the acts. That is, President Rousseff could not be held culpable for acts performed by other government officials, acts in which she did not have direct participation. The so-called pedaladas involved the administration of Plano Safra, done in the Ministry of Finance, without any participation of the president. Furthermore, the procedures thus described had been used by previous federal and state governments routinely, including by members of the Senate Commission, as, for example, Senator Anastasia from PSTB, a champion of pedaladas when he was former governor of Minas Gerais, and he was the rapporteur of the Senate's Special Commission on the Impeachment. Um, well, I had a lot more to say. But the, the rest is not exactly, not even drafted, so maybe I should stop here. The, the thing about political instability to be the next, the next thing, I really worry about the fact that lots of people who comment on this, what happened in Brazil, argue correctly that political instability has become a normal uh, in Latin America. Now there are no longer military coups, and the political instability brings down governments quite often. However, the governments go, but democracy stays. That's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a joke. There is no democracy left in a situation like this. And I could go on telling why, but I think uh, the main reason, one of the main reasons, as I see it as a historian, are reasons that I'm sure uh, Kisha Khan will develop uh, next. Thank you. Thank you. There are not that many slides, so. <laughs> um, Bon noche and good evening. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank my colleagues James Green and Ramon Stern for organizing um, today's um, panel discussion. And I also want to thank uh, Professor Shaloub for being um, always a great comrade and teacher during this very important process, and obviously for providing such an important outline of, um, of the events involving, um, involved in the coup. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Professor, um, she's not here, but uh, Professor Ana Flavia Magalhães, who played a key role in our gaining access to some of the most impressive and diverse group of analysts, um, social movement actors, journalists, politicians, and scholars while we were in Brazil, probably um, unprecedented, ac unprecedented access um, in my um, own experience in Brazil. And of course, um, I want to thank the students, faculty, and community members who are here um, today. And in the Africana kind of radical tradition, um, I'm, my intention here is just to provide um, an analysis of the key questions facing the majority black population and push us to direct our discussion around the broader questions of social justice in Brazil and beyond. Um, so I'll focus a little bit about kind of what is at stake with all of this. And I should say that if I seem a little kind of nervous and stressed out, it's because this process has been kind of nerve-wracking and stressful, <laughs> to say the least. I just wanted to kind of give a couple of examples um, before I start reading um, of what we experienced um, during our trip. And um, one is, you know, we have this lovely, wonderful kind of visit um, um, with President uh, Lula. And that same night, uh, this is what <laughs> we had to also kind of contend with. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just kind of stop there. So I would like to begin my brief um, reflection with a confession. When I arrived in Brazil in early July, like many others, I was still in a state of shock 
about the passing of Luisa Barrios a few days prior. Black movement activist and former minister of racial equality, Louisa was a beloved warrior in the fight for racial equality that included the extension of rights to domestic workers and Quilombola communities, the implementation of affirmative action in higher education and civil service, and the integration of policies of racial equality in all spheres of government. It is impossible to dissociate the memory of Luisa Bajos from the everyday and institutional battles that brought Brazil to this breaking point. Articulating and delivering a national project of social inclusion necessarily meant prioritizing and bringing about racial equality in the country. It meant educating and mobilizing the black and brown masses to demand and claim social rights. To hear almost everyone in an impressive group of scholars, politicians, former ministers, journalists, um, uh, former presidents and current president, and leaders of major social justice organizations identify the race question as being at the core of this current war of position in Brazil forced me to recognize that this discursive shift is the result of the arduous work of women like Luisa Bajos. Intersecting race, gender, and cl class and sexuality in the public sphere has meant that actual bodies have been put on the line. Real men and women have lived and died for the social transformation of recent decades. This understanding of social justice, a vision of making Brazil more equal, is what Luisa and many others have worked so hard for. Brazil, she had stated, had to admit to the existence of a white identity sedimented in power and privilege, an admission that was absolutely necessary in order to bring about permanent change. She asserted that people, public managers, and authorities must abandon racism and affirmed that I cannot think of myself as a woman without thinking of me as a black woman, as a reminder that even in a country led by a female president, deep racial tensions remained. Imagining another Brazil had to involve imagining a nation devoid of racism. What I, when I had the unique opportunity to hear Jilma Rousseff inside the National Palace speak of the Brazilian elite's unwillingness to relinquish power to black and indigenous people, women, poor people, and sexual minorities, the voice of Luisa Bajos echoed, echoed in my ears. How many forums, meetings, and marches had she attended um, in Brazil and beyond its borders to tell the truth about racism, sexism, and homophobia in her country? How many doors had she pushed her way through in order to place the racial agenda and the, on the table? Historian Kim Butler rightly, rightly reminds us that for Afro-Brazilians, freedom had never been given, but always fought for. With the death of Luisa Baio still so fresh, the impeachment of Gilmar Rousseff, the indictment of a social democratic process with race at its core was even more offensive, a slap in the face to many whose bodies had been tortured and disappeared, who had given their last breath to the creation of a Brazil, un país para todos, a Brazil, un país mais rico, sem pobreza. I had the special opportunity to meet other black women whose lives had been touched by Luisa Bajos. They were longtime comrades, Soli Carnero. They had worked in the ministry under her leadership, uh, um, or they had documented her, um, her work in scholarship or in the media. I couldn't help but wonder what it meant for Luisa, like so many others, to have lived through the golpe of 1964, fought in student and labor movements to usher in a democratic regime, struggled to build new tools of democracy to tra transform the lives of the black and brown masses, to yet live again through another coup against that expansion of these democratic rights. Would she think that it is inevitable that in a society that has always natu naturalized inequality, that inclusion would always be followed by resistance? Would she also ask, que país é esse? Brazil, para quem? Ana Flavia Magalhães stated in a conversation with Sueli Carneiro, há golpes quase todos os anos contra, contra a população negra. So every year, there are these golpes, these schools against the black population. The project had always been clear. Blacks only served to clean the bathrooms, and the state apparatuses consolidated its strict fun function to exterminate and disappear anyone who subverted that racial social order. It has always been a project of a nation without blacks, a nation with uma pretaliada extinguivio. What is that, a pretaliada? I don't know. <laughs> you get it. To that precise the words of W.B. Du Bois, 
What does it mean to be a problem? We understand that in Brazil, the, the violence wielded to repress that collective problem has been routinized and institutionalized. However, a war is taking place, place precisely because blacks, women, and poor people resist inadequate education and housing, document forced sterilizations, and fight the impunity of the state-sanctioned death squads. It is in this vein that I can remember the voice of Jorema Vernecki in her interview, the coup is against us, a coup against social rights. She affirms, os militares no saíram de seus quartéis. The coup is about putting back order in the big house, rescuing the old hegemonies, keeping the shanties in their rightful place. For these social movement activists, they are less interested in the legal technicalities that legitimate, legitimated this war against social equality. The coup, the coup is about um, disputing and reclaiming power and keeping racial and class privilege intact. They impeached our poor people, black people, gays and lesbians. They are at the center of the small victories gained in the last 13 years. The Atentado a Democracia is an attack on, the on, on, on a conscious and active civil society, the democratization of social rights, and the practice of citizenship. For those of us who work in communities with people who occupy the margins of Brazilian society, the coup is deeply personal. The Bolsa Familia, cash transfer, SUS, Sistema Unica de Saúde, the free and public healthcare system, Mia Casa, Mia Vida, My House, My Life, and affirmative action are policies that have changed the everyday lives of people in profound ways. The last two decades were unprecedented moments in Brazilian history. The Constitution of 1988 codified a social democratic agenda. The election of Lula symbolized a significant social change. He was not black. He was not white. Um, he was from Sao Paulo, but he was not Paulistano. This was a significant change in the representation of political leadership. He was a worker, an activist, a, a, a supposedly nobody who became president of the republic. Radical changes were made to the statutes for the rights of women and LGBTQ people. Domestic sexual violence was transformed into a public issue. Quilombola communities were recognized and received land rights. Racism was criminalized, in which perpetrators could be prosecuted and services were provided to attend to systematic racism. Affirmative action in, edu in higher education codified in the Constitution, this law not only obligated Brazilian whites to manifest themselves as white, but also revealed the insidious nature of, the, uh, nature of racial hatred and the unwillingness of whites to concede privilege and power. With the monitoring of education and health care at the core of programs like Bolsa Familia, alongside affirmative action and the construction of more universities and technical schools in the poorest parts of the country, poor people experience access to social mobility. But poor people, black people, women sharing the public sphere makes people uncomfortable, Lula reminded us. And he was looking dead at me. In a country seeing black women as domestic, only as domestic workers, he told us that black women who walk through the door of an aircraft or a public building still make pe makes people feel like they are out of place. Jilma spoke of the children of domestic workers or the domestic workers themselves who sit in university, in university classrooms and discover what they had been missing in terms of knowledge and the concrete access to better work and living conditions. She also spoke of the, of the beloved Cuban doctors who, according to rural re residents, touch them, come to their houses, and make them feel like human beings. It is even more important that, um, that these, these, it's more important to note that these social gains accomplish more than the transformation of, materi of the material conditions of people's lives. People, as Lula stated, formally excluded, began to see themselves as social and political subjects. There was a space for them to act in Brazilian society. Knowledge gained in universities and social movements had led to consciousness that always leads to resistance and organized struggle. And the analogy that Lula used, and I think is really important, he said it's like a man, a poor man eating beef for the first time. He said beefy for the uh, primera vez and knowing what it tastes like and unwilling to go back to not eating beefy. When he said it at that time, it actually, I'm a vegetarian, but it sounded quite <laughs> powerful. <laughs> So what has already been done in the past year 
and what is being threatened. And there are several places that you can go and look and see how so many of these proposals are already um, in place um, to dismantle social rights. These are just a, a few examples that are kind of important to me. So during the interim government of Michel Temer, he established an all-male and white cabinet, the first government with no women since the military dictatorship. There was also um, no representation of Brazil's racial diversity. And I should add that during Lula's and Gilman's Jill government, there were 11 and 15 women ministers respect, um, in terms of numbers. The Ministry of Women, Racial Equality, and Human Rights got subsumed under the Ministry of Justice as a secretariat. Ministry of Agrarian Development, which is central to rural, and develop, um, rural development of the country and the fight against hunger and inequality was dissolved. It meant a coup against small family-owned farms, a promotion of foods and national um, and nutritional security in the country. The Bolsa uh, Familia ended up in no ministry. The Ministry of Science and Technology was also dissolved. Just as more poor people, blacks and indigenous people began to enter the university through the affirmative action programs, there is a push and threat to privatize higher education um, for public universities to model North American universities and start charging. There has, um, there's already been a 45% cut in federal funding to university, um, including for, I think, um, Agilsa Sotero was telling me about the Abogias Nascimento uh, project, um, I think was recently cut. Uh, Jerry can talk about that. The privatization of higher education is part of a broader neoliberal project of Brazil a venda or Brazil for sale to provide, um, to privatize everything as much as possible. And, and Michelle Temer recently explained that part of Jilma Rousseff's problem is that she refused to go along with this neoliberal um, plan for the country. This is, that, um, that is most evident in Jilma's resistance to opening of restrictions for foreign land purchases and foreign investments in the pre-salt um, petroleum extraction in the country, or Presal. She was adamant about the majority of the Presal profits being controlled by the Brazilian government and going toward public health and education. Um, changes to the, the, to the Presal rules um, that many consider to also be at the center of the school favors foreign companies and, and obviously in the new proposals, less for, uh, resources would go to education and um, public health. I could go on, but obviously there's been a lot of changes already to, the so to Social Security um, and, and that even as a, as a consequence, Social Security will, it being um, subsumed, or the Previdencia Social being subsumed under the Ministry of Fazenda is also tied to the um, the economic um, agenda and the market. And we all know what that means um, to rely on the market. So the need for Brazilian embassies on the African continent um, has already been questioned, um, even though, despite the fact that the establishment of um, diplomatic relations under Lula and Dilma were more, uh, were about more than the economic development of Brazil in Africa and about constructing long-term relationships with African nations based on cultural ties, cultural and social ties of the African, the majority African descendant um, Brazilian population. Um, the, the interim minister of health want, um, wanted to include evangelical churches in the discussions about abortion rights. Um, there's been um, suspension of new constructions on the, under the program Mia Casa Mia Vida, and I highlight this here um, as it's, it's, it's um, a program that's near and dear um, in terms of to my own research on housing and land rights. The Ministry of Cities abandoned the goal set by Jilma Rousseff of building two million homes by the end of 2018, at the same time that the Casa Economica expanded the financing of homes for the rich earning up to three million dollars. So many have claimed that Akasha agora é dos ricos. In 2015, um, 91 billion was committed to build 800,000 homes that would benefit three million people. Since its creation, the program had um, benefited more than 10 million people, and in 2015, um, 2015 alone, more than 1,200 homes were handed over per day. Financing since the interim government um, has stopped for families in category, um, cat, what's called fasha, fasha um, or the, the first category, that income for families earn, earning incomes up to 1,800 reais in the fasha dois, for um, families earning income up to um, 3,600 reais. Um, many say that it has, it has now become uh, what they call mia mansão, mia vida, or um, <laughs> precisely because of the of the increase in the the the, um, the amount, so that while they have cut people in category one and two, they've increased um, the possibility of financing for people earning more money. Um, 
and he's as as um, you can't see this here, but one of the things that um, the the author of this article said, he said, sin um, without subsidio, without subsidies, um, qualquer um sabe pobre não compra nem caixa de papelão para dormir. So he can't even um, uh, buy a cardboard box without um, um, financing from um, government banks in Brazil. So we know what that means in terms of the ex um, the expansion of property ownership in Brazil. The, uh, one of the key things that was being discussed while we were in Brazil was the threat to unlimit, to open internet access. Um, for those who have um, lived through the 1964 um, coup, they understand that the first thing to go is a, a freedom of expression. Um, we are already seeing um, cuts to funding for public television, and which as some of the journalists highlight, highlighted in their interviews, and even a significant number of journalists, many of whom were recently, um, what was it, form, recently um, graduated uh, black uh, journalists who covered the stories of the most marginalized segment of the population have already lost their jobs. Land rights for indigenous and Quilombola communities have been threatened to be suspended, threats through the Bolsa Familia that currently serves 50 million people, an audit that threatens to cut um, about 10 percent, um, and just by the end of the month of September six, 2016, more than 600,000 recipients will be cut due to this audit, audit and a restriction, um, not just on only on the requirement, but how you provide, for example, identification, requiring that all members of the household um, provide their CPS fee, including small children. So, um, um, and there'll be bonuses provided to the mayors of, um, of these towns that can cut families from the program. So the suspension of all, and so that's one of the, the most significant and celebrated projects of, of um, the last 13 years that have, have seen um, a decrease in terms of poverty in Brazil um, as one of the first programs under attack um, in this interim government. Suspension of all areas related to human rights, with the, ex with the exception of police forces, um, the su suspension of negotiations to receive Syrian refugees and the dismantling of programs to assist Haitian immigrants, um, the Fundação Nacional do Índio, um, that uh, the, the, the director um, that was appointed um, openly supported the military regime that built highways, hydroelectric um, plants, deforest and, de and supported deforestation that resulted in, the, in the, resulted in the expulsion of indigenous communities from their lands and thousands of deaths. Um, there's been a uh, proposal for an educational health spending freeze for 20 years, um, and as well as um, the Jose Aceja um, naming um, the policeman, a policeman involved in the 1992 Karanjiru massacre that killed 110, 11 men um, to, um, um, I'm blanking on the ministry that he was appointed to, but I'll find out. And as well as something that directly, hmm? Justice. Justice. Gracias. Obrigada. <laughs> Um, if I can tell you how many languages I speak in, a, in, in the everyday, yeah. Um, most importantly, one of the programs that directly impact um, even Brown and the students that come to Brown, and this is also really significant to highlight at a moment when um, more blacks and um, black and brown students and indigenous students enter the university is the um, dissolving of this um, the program Science Without Borders, um, and um, and that and especially a cut to 20% of the scholarship for um, Iniciación Científica for scientific initiation. It is also important to note that more recently um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has criticized not only the lack of di uh, gender and racial diversity in the interim government, but um, criticized. The, the fact that the interim government took such sharp measures in the regression of, so, of economic, social, and cultural rights. According to the Protocolo um, San Salvador, ratified by Brazil in 1996, the state in principle is forbidden from adopting policies, measures, and laws that without proper justification worsen the situation of economic, social, and cultural rights enjoyed by the population. The undermining or worsening by the state by, of those factors without just cause will constitute an, uh, would constitute an unauthorized regression under the protocol. Um, in in um, October, and I think this is really important to, to emphasize as well um, in terms of an attack of human rights, um, and this is something that the, the Inter-American Commission also denounced, that the Senate approved a counter um, counterterrorism um, bill that contained um, a broad, a kind of a vague, vague language that, that you, could, you could prosecute um, demonstrators and others engaged in, the, in dissent, political dissent in Brazil as terrorists. Um, as well as another vote that really kind of 
cuts to the core of the of the communities um, that I work in is the fact that in August, uh, July and August um, 2015, um, the Chamber of Deputies approved um, the constitutional amendment that would allow um, the 16 and 17 year old children um, accused of serious crimes to be punished as adults. So I know that's something um, that's also being um, discussed. What's also um, was also highlighted by the Inter-American um, um, uh, uh, group on, on human rights is that the Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will shall be expressed in periodic and, genu and genuine elections, which should will shall be by universal and equal suffrage. So as just to conclude and just to, and there are so many more that I could um, list in terms of the um, in terms of a, a coup on, on social rights in Brazil, as one um, interviewer state, no sé si a golpe, mas parece que a golpe. But that is not what necessarily we're debating here. Um, but sociologist uh, Ricardo Artunas writes in a recent article, if this goes into style, if we let it, Temer's non-elected government, and I think there's an emphasis on the non-elected government may be capable of taking workers' rights, for example, back to 1888. In other words, the slavery era. So that is what we should be talking about here. As a feminist um, scholar and activist, I could not ignore the misogyny operating at the core of this atentado on democratic and social rights in Brazil. This has broader um, implications for how we understand um, political leadership and how women do politics. The, impeachments, the impeachment of Brazil's first woman president made visible precisely how sexism operates in the public sphere. It is undeniable that the questioning of her capac capacity to govern was tied to her status as a woman. Dilma, I should um, say, who at the age of 20 had been um, in prison, and many of you are familiar with her story, um, learned politics and was um, perceivably understood to more, way more, um, than Lula. And this is something that even Lula himself expressed um, in his interview. But Lula was perceived as un articulador político, so a political articulator with a lot of power of dialogue. I think my rough translation, he was un encantador. I don't know how charming. to translate. Charming. charming. Yeah. Um, Dilma, ela queria se meter em tudo. She had an explosive personality that created dysfunction. Um, and, he, and I think it's also important that a couple of, a couple of the interviewers um, I highlighted how Lula would, in, would invite influential politicians and their wives to dinner or watch movies in the National Palace. Um, in, the, in the business of doing politics, he would talk to the wives, and then they would talk to the husbands, et cetera, that he was, that was part of the, the, the way of doing um, political work, unlike. Many, including J um, Lula, thought that Jilma would be treated better because she was a woman, an intellectual, capable, culta. She would, however, she was mistreated precisely because she was a woman. And I should kind of want to have a side note, and I almost kind of chose one of the pictures um, of her embracing um, Sydney, but I thought, I knew that he would feel slightly uncomfortable. Um, but she had read um, um, his book on Machado de Assis in great detail um, prior to our, our interview to kind of, and, and, and reflected um, for a very long time about it. So I think that kind of, for me, kind of exemplified precisely um, the kind of serious intellectual and political thinker that she is in her, her, her own right. But it's important to, to, to highlight precisely how um, misogyny kind of operated um, in this instance. There was an emphasis on deconstructing her as a woman, a focus per, um, on her body. And I didn't, I specifically, I, c I had no courage in, within me to show the, the sticker, the gas tank sticker um, that had been made popular in Brazil. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, so the first evaluation that she received focused on her style that ultimately contaminated the broader um, society. The media commented on how many times she hugged. Um, we heard statements such as, Sabia que la no era Lula Gisaya. So that she, we knew that she wasn't Lula in a skirt, 
right? They described her as hysterical. A presidenta grita, a presidenta não tem paciência, não sabe negociar, é mulher, não sabe mesmo. So there was a sense that she was in, using very um, kind of uh, gendered terms um, that we're familiar with to describe why she was not successful in governing, right? So what I found really fascinating is um, Jilma's own response, and I'm just summarizing this, I don't have the exact word in. She would say, well, you know, I'll be in these meetings with these well-behaved men um, around me who just don't yell or slam their hands on the table, right? Right? <laughs> so her be behavior um, was sexualized as well. A presidenta precisa de um namorado para fazer ela se acalmar, right? How, have you ever heard someone say that a male president needs a girlfriend to calm him down? Right? Then there, were the, there are those who had the courage to say, why not be a nice lady and resign? Right? And this was something that came up in her interview as well. They want me, they think I'm going to resign. Right? They want me to resign because I'm a woman. Is it possible that women leaders, I concluded, are punished for doing politics differently? There's this, what I, what came out in a lot of the interviews was this tendency, and I think Glazy Hoffman, one of the senators, kind of summarized this quite well, not to do politics outside of the institutional space. For example, the politics of dinner parties, whiskey, meetings outside of the regular business hours, the, pract the practice of a logic of organizing the private separate from the public sphere, the intentional decision to maintain her relationship with the private space, for example, as a family space. Um, is it, as some argue, that political integrity got in her way, her unwillingness to bend on the social democratic goals of the Workers' Party, right? This unwillingness to negotiate is also a part of being a woman. In this final point, it is by always working towards a politics of social justice that she gets read as lacking the knowledge of how to do politics, even though she's doing precisely the politics she had set out to do. So I wanted to end with just a few uh, final points for us to consider, kind of a question of what now, where to, and my answer would be always toward a social justice project. This is part of our, this is a picture from our, our meeting. Some of the contradictions that we must confront um, in our discussion, um, and I think uh, Iliani Broom, a leading journalist, um, was one that kind of articulated this quite well. She said that the rich, in essence, over the past 13 years have been advances, but the wealth of the rich remain untouched. Racial and class privilege has largely remained intact. So the central question in Brazil needs to be, what are we willing to lose in order to achieve full equality. So there was more spending towards social program, but there was not a redistribution of wealth. And why hasn't the question of the genocide of black people been advanced in recent decades, um, while there's an increased militarization of the police? So Brazilians um, also must deal with their identity crisis. And it's funny because sometimes I feel like I'm saying we, but then I realize I'm not Brazilian. <laughs> Pardon. Um, spent most, most of my adult life in Brazil, it seems. A social and cultural, a social cultural aspect of Brazilian identity that is very powerful and that drives politics at all levels. This myth of cordiality, happy people, a myth of nonviolence that they are peaceful and generous people. But what I learned in many of the interviews is that this impeachment process shows precisely a people full of hate. Um, the myth of racial democracy, that they don't know racial and gender and sexual prejudice, but that there is a clear genocide against black youth taking place. Brazil is a country founded on the extermination of the other. Um, Brazil, as um, Eliane Brum stated, é um país de lynchadores, it's a, país, um, it's a country of, of lynchers, of lynchmen. That the violence, there's this idea that the violence comes from criminality. Um, and those who produce the violence and the disorder are not Brazilian in their essence. Um, that there is order, that order and progress or order, um, ordem e segurança is the Brazilian essence and that the society has always been threatened from the outside. Hence, a strong state is needed. This impacts the function and non-function of the constitution um, for bringing about pre peace, 
order and security. And you'd see that one of these, so the non-function um, would be um, the current instance of the Constitution. The incapacity of operating with contradiction or opposition um, requires, or so danger and any kind of disorder away from what is what is considered kind of this social racial <coughs> order needs to be resolved with the force of the law, right? Um, arbitrary use of the law. So some of the lessons and, 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 and questions from my own experiences and for all of us perhaps is that again, democracy is not given, but fought for. Um, and as many have written, um, so no, see, a país no for para todos, no sirve para ninguém. So if, if peace is not for, for all of us, it doesn't serve for anyone. Si no haber segurança para todos, no haberá segurança para ninguém in that same vein. So if there's no security for, the, for all of us, there's no security for anyone. Some have argued that Brazil is still a deeply depoliticized country, that the transformation of the society um, socially and politically and economically must be accompanied by the transformation of the consciousness of communities to strengthen its base. So many comment that one of the error um, of the, the current, um, of the, of the Juma and Lula's government is the ability to kind of strengthen the base that had already been um, influenced, deeply influenced, for example, by evangelical churches, et cetera. So the loss of this, of this base to other groups that were doing kind of a, a politics of prosperity, et cetera. So the conscious, so the social programs needed to be also followed by consciousness programs as well. A transformation in consciousness. So the question that I would, um, I have questions that I would leave us with is, what does the social justice project truly preoccupy with the well-being of Brazil look like? How do we dismantle the need at the core of social projects such as Bolsa Familia and engage in a redistribution of wealth and resources? Um, and many commented on the, the urgent need for political reform. Furthermore, as social scientists and humanists focus in our research on Brazil, and most of us are non-Brazilians residing outside of the country, what is our role in the construction of a new society, a more just Brazil? In essence, what is our intention here as scholars, and how do we forge political solidarity during these critical moments? I want to end with the assertion that in my recent dialogues with Afro-Brazilian scholar activists like Vera Benedito, it is important that we, I, that we carry on the legacy of our women warriors like Luisa Bajos. I came back from Brazil even more certain that it is impossible to remain silent on these important political issues and that a global understanding of social justice must be able, must be at the center of our academic work. Thank you. So we have 40 minutes, and what we're going to do, we're going to finish at 9 punctually um, tonight. So what we're going to be doing is I'm going to accept uh, three questions. I'm going to ask people to make them short and concise and not uh, make presentations. And then I'll let the, the two speakers respond to them, and then we'll continue rounds of uh, questions if they want to respond. So the floor is open. And uh, Ramon, maybe you can help us with people who want to speak so that this, I guess the, the taping can get that well as, as it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So uh, the floor is open. This is, means two things. It was a really good presentation, there's nothing to be said, or it was a really bad presentation and people don't know what to say about it. Can I make comments? Please. that the election, the PSDB was going to win the election. I, I, and then I think that the action that um, Sidney said just, bef just after the election, PSDB action, it, uh, it's very important to, to see that there, there was like a, um, a very strong party in Brazilian politics uh, showing this uh, this kind of 
because the there, there was no, no never no one contested elections in Brazil. And the fact that PSGP contested the result of the election, I think it was like a sign for for the conjunction, the concerted action of the other actors to to ouster. <coughs> Not to let the govern at the beginning even uh, in Congress, but not because of the institutions of the coalition government or presidential government or coalition presidential is nothing like this. But I'm, I'm telling this just because I think the, the fact that people usually can analyze uh, give a very strong role to the institutions in explaining bad things in Brazil. It just um, makes us not to see the real reasons. I don't think it, this, the, the reasons, the main explanations are in the institutions. It's just this. And we'll ask people to um, identify themselves. That's Angelina Figueiredo, a visiting uh, professor from uh, from Brazil, from the copies, and she's with us, a political scientist. So, Ben, and I have a third person who wants to raise their hand. Okay, we have from our first round. Ben, would you like to ask your question, then we'll take another round. Yeah. Sure. My name is Ben Bradlaugh. I'm a PhD student in sociology. Um, thanks for these really interesting and comprehensive presentations, um, passionate and filled with real empirical detail from uh, your month in Brazil. Um, it seems that uh, given the empirics that you've presented, the, the resolution uh, that you are investigating could quite easily be upheld. Uh, the, the question that strikes me then, is it your view that Brazil is still a democracy, given the kinds of things that, that you're discussing here? The, the language of a coup, uh, I understand that in the Brazilian context, it has quite a, a, a it has a social life of its own. Golpista is now kind of a social category uh, in common parlance. Uh, but as his, as as academics, does does this experience lead you to describe Brazil as a democracy? Uh, Seth Rackerson, um, just a, 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 a professor of political science, but I'm a, I'm a neighbor now. That's why I'm here. Welcome. Um, <laughs> And I'm delighted to be a neighbor. Um, I, I really enjoyed the presentations, both of them. And I think they're, they're very textured, nuanced, um, and I think important to help understand the current moment. I want to go back to where you began, Sydney, in 2013, um, because I had a slightly different read on what was going on in Brazil at that moment. And I just want to pose it. And uh, I was in Sao Paulo, Salvador, and Rio. I saw a very diverse um, mobilization in all three places. I don't, I, and I had a number of uh, Pachista friends who I thought were dismissing what they were seeing on the streets. That is, I don't think it was just one thing. I think there were many flavors. In Salvador, the black movement was very, was mobilized on the street, just for example. In Sao Paulo, while there was much coverage of the middle class being in the, in the streets, in the center city, in the south zone, a very different mobilization that was working class and again black. And so, and I also had a sense that probably if we looked at 55 cities, we might have had, in fact, 55 stories of who was involved. I was struck by that I thought the Pete didn't have an articulated view about how to, how to work with diverse mobilization. And that it had perhaps lost its way in its relationship to mobilization. That, that was a strong mm -hmm. sense that I had by 2013. And so I'm, and, and I think the question's relevant just because of thinking about the democratic questions. Where, what, where, where does Brazil go from here? Um, I, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the relationship of the party and mobilization, and, and what difference did it make in how this all transpired? And I'm going to take a fourth question from Amy, so we'll have four for them to answer, and then we'll have another block. Did you still have a question? Yes. Um, okay. My name is Amy Nunn. I'm uh, an associate professor of public health here. I wanted to know what you all think are the public health implications of the coup. 
That's it. Good. Okay, so we'll get we'll get a second round in a minute. We're going to let this answer, and then we'll we have lots of time. So, do you want to speak first? Okay, so I. Um, well, all the questions are very are very complex. Just just about um, um, contesting the election and the importance of this. Uh, when we were, one day we were having lunch during this um, uh, period in Brazil, during the legations work, and Kisha Khan asked me, right? Surprising, I mean, there's, all of a sudden, what, what shocked you most about these events? I don't know if you remember this. And uh, I had the, the answer, I mean, the, I couldn't, I didn't need to think for two seconds. What really shocked me was that I thought we had, and this is really old fashioned language, but I'm angry so I can use it. I really thought that we had gone above this very low degree of civilization of not having a basic respect for electoral results. So it's really a failure of civilization. You know, how come <laughs> that people lose an election and because of that, instead of continue the democratic struggle, work to bring down government. That was, I mean, for someone like me, you know, so many of us who grew up in a military dictatorship and saw the construction of democracy, this was unthinkable. And it took me a long time to believe that this was coming. You know? So then uh, uh, I think, uh, Argelina, that it's really um, shocking that these people took this road. And I still don't understand it to tell you the truth. I mean, of course, I understand it as a historian. And then I have to think in long term. Think of slavery, think of the things that Kisha Khan is talking about. Um, uh, I would start, you know, in this repeated pattern of periods of expansion of rights followed by right-wing coups. And, and this is, you know, I could start with the abolition of slavery. I mean. Uh, however beautiful Republican regime is in comparison with a monarchy, the monarchy fell in Brazil because of a legislative process of expansion of rights of slaves that led to abolition. The monarchy had to go, right? And so it's a repeated pattern. And, and, and there is a long-term historical explanation that you know, makes me understand what happened. But rationally, when I was going through that process, I just couldn't believe it. How are these guys doing this? You know, so this is, uh, and also in terms of, of drafting the, the report, the real challenge is to try to distinguish, I mean, to pay attention to contingency. Of course, there were two or three crazy guys who were thinking of bringing down the government from the first minute. But it took lots of circumstances and lots of, um, not accidental, but lots of um, circumstances for this to become possible for the majority of the Gulpistas. And so that, you know, and, and that's why I, I, uh, I make an effort to highlight the fact that some of the main cardinals of the PSDB took a long time to jump on that boat of the impeachment. But they did, and this is an inexcusable, right? They did, eventually they did. Right? Um, so is Brazil still a democracy? Of course not. Of course not. If you look at if you look at, at a table, a chart about what happens in Brazil from 1930 to now, of 19 presidents, only four completed their terrorist presidents. Four who were elected legally by the people. Elected by the people and concluded their. You know, there are people who are not elected and concluded their mandate. Uh, of course, the other <laughs> dictators and so on. If you put a chart with elected, concluded the tenure. The, you know, the real normal democratic thing, four presidents from 1930 onwards. What democracy is it? It's no democracy, right? There's no democracy in Brazil. No democratic tradition, no nothing, right? We thought, and this is the shock, that we are perhaps getting there. Sweet illusion, right? <laughs> Sweet. What's the sweetest of all illusions of my life? <laughs> but it's gone, it's gone. And, and I think Kishakan made a wonderful uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm feeling a little envious of you, Kishokan, yeah. <laughs> because I had all the boring stuff of narrating <laughs> the facts. And you, and you, and we did it together. I'm responsible for that. I gave her this, we, you know, you do the wonderful thing, and then I rate this go pistols at work, which is <laughs> terrible. Right? But it is what was one of the really interesting experiences we had, because we chose to interview a significant number of people who were the real ones who were defeated in the school. Mm. You know, Dilma, of course, it was nice to listen to her. But you know, in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, well, while Dilma and Cunha were having this you know, uh, fighting to death, the people who were actually losing were the ones who were talking to. And they had a very clear understanding uh, of that. So, uh, about the 2013 manifestation. You are right, I mean, I was tried to be, I tried to be very careful in what I wrote, saying that 2013 is still a mystery. I think we don't understand very well what happened. We need to study this a lot better to understand. I think there are several layers to it, several phases. It started one way, moved to another thing, finished another thing, and uh, we don't really know what happened. What I, the only thing I said was that of the several legacies it may have uh, uh, given us, one sure legacy was that the white middle class learned how to agitate again. Yeah. You know, and then, so this is, uh, this, there are other legacies, but this one for the following, for what happened afterwards, is an important legacy of, of that moment. But I know it is full of other. Jirata Jha is an example, but it was not. I mean, Jirata Jha, after it was really the, the protagonism, was basically in a much wider thing. They were there too, but it has no, it didn't continue. I mean, it was there, brought down the president, and that was over. Now it continued. It was a, it's a legacy that continues. You're talking for uh, a demo or Jirata Jha? For a, for a no, I'm talking to, oh, well, no, the new Jirata Jha is another thing. I'm talking about, I, I assume he was talking about the Jirata Jha uh, in 1984. Uh, let me. the popular movements preceding Collins impeachment. Yeah, that are, yes. I'm, say, I'm saying that these were flashes. These were flashes of middle class participation. They did not continue. This time, it happened in 2013, and they're still out on the streets. I'm talking about a continuity. Uh, I'm just making the argument that now it's left a legacy that is still going on. Although, of course, the manifestations of 2013, as I said, are complex and has many different meanings. Uh, yeah, this is one, yes, this is what I'm talking about, yeah. That, uh, Public health. Public health. Uh, actually, there was um, one of the interviewees, um, Juliana Nunes, mm. uh, who also worked with, uh, with uh, public health. Um, I don't remember the details of her answer. I think she mentioned the specific projects that were underway that had been immediately uh, brought into question. Uh, but I, I don't remember which. I don't, I don't remember details, unfortunately. But uh, there was this... Um, um, she, she was a militant of movements having to do with health care for black women. And she said the initiatives that had been underway uh, in, the, in Dilma's government had been uh, almost immediately affected, but I don't remember which. So feel free to answer yeah. any or yeah. all. Um, just to, to, to follow up on that, um, part of the, um, I think there was an economist that gave a, I can't remember the precise analogy, and I have to go back and listen. Um, but she said that um, the kind of the attack on social rights is almost as if you know, families ex you know, experiencing, for example, uh, um, economic problems, and instead of taking um, the key away from the, the older son who is driving this fancy car, um, they go and they kind of take the kid out of you know, you know, some special education program or something of the sort. So in terms of the, 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 the focus immediately on um, kind of the repeal of social rights is really... Um, indicative of precisely what, you know, where the direction of the country and where, um, what are the kind of the priorities um, for the masses of the people. And I think in terms of public health, uh, one of the main concerns is um, 
really what's going to happen with this kind of universal healthcare system that is sui says has already been um, criticized and but already but was serving um, the majority of the population in terms of um, access to some level of, of health care. Also, the Bolsa Familia is really important because health care was built into um, receiving the cash transfer, right? That there you had to regularly evaluate yourself and your children um, to also to receive the, the Bolsa. So any kind of cut means there's a significant um, portion of the population is not receiving kind of the mandatory um, health care associated um, with the program. Um, so some of the other details I would have to look up as well, but there have already been a lot of kind of programs already been cut, um, especially around what's going to happen with debates around reproductive rights. I kind of mentioned it briefly, but the, to suggest that the evangelical churches should be part of those conversations. We already know what, um, what direction um, those conversations would go in. Um, as a follow-up um, to the question around the 2013 events, I think that's an important point. Uh, one of the things we didn't highlight but came up a lot in the, the conversations were that the media played an important role um, in the coup, that they were a principal actor, and a principal actor in representing precisely the activism that was taking place. So a lot of the representations and the manifestations were on only a particular segment of um, of the, the folks on the ground, right? Even that, so there are a lot of different kinds of people manifesting for various kinds of reasons yeah. on the ground, yeah. but only particular groups were represented yeah. in the media. And then um, TV Global and, and many others had a key role in kind of representing political dissent against um, the government, right? So I think that's really important. Um, also, the question around visibility. So in, um, with all that's taking place, I think one of the, the things that came up was uh, many people felt as though one of the errors of um, the government was that there was not a constant presence, right? The kind of speaking back to the people. So there's all of these things that are being said that and, and criticizing the government, but that there weren't this idea around doing social movement, that there, you weren't, there wasn't that constant conversation and speaking back to the population to contradict what had been, you know, what was being said about corruption, about um, the economic problems, et cetera, that there should have been a more consistent presence, kind of a conscientization, whatever the word is, consciousness raising process should have been more consistent, right, um, through the use of alternative media and, and media in general. So it should have been a constant kind of speaking back to the population. Um, is Brazil uh, still a democracy? Um, it, for me, I, I don't want to use the term kind of reconstruction, <laughs> but I think there's this, there's this um, kind of a failed attempt at democracy that um, WB kind of Du Bois talks about, that there's this moment kind of, a, kind of an expansion of rights and that people start to kind of realize that, oh, okay, this could get a little scary. We're incorporating the masses of the population um, and there's a repeal of rights. Um, I didn't mention this, but it turns out that at the, the National Palace, um, they, someone wanted to interview um, Sydney, and Sydney said, no, interview Keisha Khan. And I was like, ah, oh, what am I going to say? And they said, speak about, speak 10 minutes. And I was like, ah, oh, all right, I'll see what I, you know, do you, you know, do, say something. And I was like, ah, oh, goodness. Um, and one of the things that I commented on was, you know, thinking about the future, um, thinking about, I think, um, is, I don't see this as in, I think what happened in the past 13 years is impossible to kind of undo. While, while some of um, the interviewers indicated that we needed more than a generation that had experienced um, access to rights, affirmative action, education, healthcare, beefy, um, according <laughs> to, to Lula, that we needed more than a generation. Um, I think because I do research on social movements and understanding that there are always social movements working, um, that they've always, I mean, a lot of people um, said that we always understood that the social justice project was incomplete, that we had always been pressing and pushing um, Lula and Jilma um, to even expand rights further, right, um, to push the society even further towards a serious kind of complete social justice project. So I don't, I'm, I have so much faith in social movements because I see that they've always, they're always taking place. Right, even though they don't get the kind of visibility that they should. So is it the end of democracy? I think it's always in process, in, in progress, I should say. Um, is there a democracy in the United States? So we can take more questions. So you had already put your item first, so it will be number one, and then number two, and then number three, and number four, and number five. Five questions. Please, identify yourself. And <coughs> um, how long have you been 
questions also regarding the manifestations in 2013? Um, we call them demonstrations also. <laughs> because demonstrations. I think the translation is manifestation. <laughs> demonstration. Yeah. 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 I used to go Two very brief comments. The first is that so if if one squinted as the impeachment proceedings were going on, it looked like a parliamentary procedure, right? That, that this was a prime minister who was being deposed, and it doesn't it shouldn't surprise, right, that, that the PSDB has long favored openly favored a parliamentary option for Brazil, um, even though twice when parliamentary options have been put to the Brazilian people, 1963 and 1993 failed, right? So this looks like kind of a clumsy attempt to impose some kind of half-assed parliamentary system, you know. Um, so, kind of, what do you think about that as a kind of procedural explanation? Second uh, comment: um, in, it, it took a long time after Goulart's uh, fall for the left to kind of rehabilitate his image and to say that you know to kind of reclaim some of what he, we, we had talked about. It took you know many many years for intellectuals to come around after criticizing Trabalhismo um, and the populism he kind of represented. But it seemed like that kind of rehabilitation has happened. What I think has been remarkable with after after Juma is that. The left has really quickly rallied around her, right? I mean, even in, in the election where she beat Ayas Yunab, there were a lot of hesitant leftists that say, look, you know, this was barely a leftist government, right? But it represents, when you have a binary choice, this is the option that we can get behind. And in this, after the re-election, she imposes this project of austerity, and it didn't look like a leftist government at first. It's not until all the, the, the legacy is threatened that the left says, well, wait a minute. We, no matter what the alternative is, this is better, right? So I think that's a, that's a good thing, right? And I think it, it helps us understand why it's not out of the realm of possibility that a candidate of the left, may or may not be PT, could win in 20, the next presidential election in 2018. Um, it's a very real prospect, which I think is encouraging, right? So I, I guess just thoughts about how this affects the next presidential election or be much more close to the, the municipal elections now um, in about a week's time. Uh, I think there were two people here, you and then Inez. Yeah. Okay. I'm Esther Kurtz, uh, also a graduate student here. Um, and it kind of segues off of yours and what Professor Perry was talking about. If you, um, in talking to especially the activists that you spoke with, if you got a sense if, of what might be next, if, if this was some kind of catalyst, and what form the next steps might take, and especially. Um, you know, this idea of a transformation of consciousness, which is something I'm like constantly think obsessing about. And if you know if there's any um, yeah, if you got any sense of from of what might come out of this and if there's maybe something new, um, especially in the social movements that might be arising and of course it might be too soon to tell, but yeah, I'm Inez Arado. I'm a, a professor at the Federal um, University of Bahia, the Health Collective Institute, and I'm an adjunct professor at the School of Health at Brown. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, one, I think Kish already uh, mentioned part of it, the strong role of the media in terms of inform or misinform the public uh, about the uh, impeachment. And on the other hand, there are, because of all the role of social media now, there's important, other important groups like Media Ninja and mm -hmm. Brazil 247. Mm -hmm. So there are other ways that the public access 
of your type of information. So if you can comment on that. And in your research, uh, what is your impression of moving to the future of what the PT party or PT representatives are reflecting on all of that? What is the role of of the Tea Party in all of that. What are they doing as a homework in terms of moving towards 218 or to the future of democracy in Brazil? Well, there was a fifth person over here. Uh, I think I call, call on you and then we'll get to you in the next round. I think Me first? The, yeah. Uh, my name is Ana Clara. I am a PhD student at Puki Rio, actually, not from here, but I'm here as a visiting scholar. And my question goes specifically to Professor Perry. If uh, you see there is a contradiction, or not, between uh, how Duma was the target of such misogynist and sexist uh, movements, political movements related to her impeachment, and on the other hand, how she did so little when she was in office in the view of many social movements, including myself, uh, in terms of uh, women's rights and indigenous rights and LGBT rights uh, in such a sense that I have friends from Complex do Alemão who are activists in Complex do Alemão who explicitly refuse to say primeiramente fora teme because for them first it is primeiramente o PP fora o PP and o UPP being a project that was implemented by PMDB but was explicitly supported by the federal government. So I wanted to know if you see if there is a contradiction or maybe a paradox or maybe an irony, I don't know. How, how's your view about that? Or even if you agree or not with me, I just wanted to know your opinion about that. Right, we'll have answers, then we'll have time for a third round at least. Oh. Then we'll have time for a very short third round for maybe two questions. <laughs> um, it's 10 of 9. Should I take two more questions? I think I'm going to do that. We have to discuss this answer. We can do that. We have to end at nine because okay. Let's do the answer and see what have left. If not, we'll just do it a little longer. Well, because Sydney has to get a train back to Cambridge. I'll drive him. I have a class to teach tomorrow morning. Um, well, um, let me say a couple of things that uh, uh, not in the order that the, the questions came. Uh, first of all, about activists, um, what we heard from activists was, on the one hand, an extremely harsh evaluation of Lula's and Dilma's government. Yeah. I mean, that thing that was said, exactly what we heard all the time. Some of them more emphatic. Jorema Werneck gave us incredible deposition just showing how the Workers' Party governments had betrayed the social justice project that made them uh, a rally for them and so on. So they were extremely critical and they were equally emphatic in the criticism of the Workers' Party government and in their recognition that uh, what happened was a very serious coup and the difference between struggling and having a very hard time trying to uh, gain and to uh, uh, rights, demanding rights with workers' parties' government is, was something completely different for what is go was going to come next. So they had this also very clear and they were uh, very much um, um, engaged in, and they are engaged in, in fighting the, the coup d'etat. Uh, the, uh, in, in terms of the parliamentary options and the PSTB and, and the thing about the uh, parliamentarism, it's really interesting. We had a, w w one of the interviews that we, we, we made was with one of the minister of the interim government, the minister of cities. And he spent a considerable time of his uh, talking to us about how the Constitution of 1988 was supposed to be parliamentarista, and then came the accident that the people didn't want it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you have to uh, adapt institutions so that what is in the Constitution uh, actually happened, despite the fact that people did not want parliamentarism. 
And then he and he said, well, you know, just the fact that someone is elected for a four-year term doesn't mean that the person has the right to govern for four years. It all depends. And so it. Uh, it's it's um, I and then I thought I see that uh, the former president Fernando Cardoso uh, also presenting this argument. Well, now we're just following the constitution. You know, if the constitution was to be parla par uh, parliamentarian, what's what's that? Parliamentary. Uh, so, so this argument is present in the in the justification that the the Gopisas use yeah. for for what happened. Um, I don't know if there were people behind the demonstrations of 2013, but I really um, understand what your teacher said. I remember during while, while the manifestations were happening, and at some point it had already taken a turn that made me really worried. And and uh, it was a student who wrote to me, "How oh, clearly excited! What's incredible! What's happening?" And I read the, the, the message and I answered back, well, I'm sorry, but I really don't like what I see. <laughs> um, and that was all I said at that moment, you know. And I don't think we could see what was coming. And in retrospect, uh, I think what I said, it left a certain legacy, which in the end was very important for the coup to happen. But of course, we could not see that in 2013. And, and, and among the things that it left as a legacy, I think it is very important to remember, I mentioned that, and, uh, and uh, uh, it was another legacy, this uh, protagonism of the media and, and the way, and the, the, of course this was not new, but, uh, but again it was reinforced. And it's very ironic that it happened uh, right a little afterwards um, What's oh, before or afterwards? A global apologize for supporting this, the, the 1964 coup d'état. Apologies before. Before, the, yeah. And then right afterwards, it recovered the tradition of, of uh, helping a coup d'état to happen. Um, so, uh, and then the thing about leftists around Dilma, it's it's uh, it's uh, um, to some extent, it already happened in the last weeks of the 2014 election. I think lots of the people who resisted supporting Dilma at the beginning in the final weeks were really scared of what was going on. And even though officially this leftist parties did not change course exactly, uh, I, I think their vote was important and their critique of what was going on during the electoral process also helped this shift in the last minute that allowed her to be elected. But, you know, I think there is a possibility that something happens in 2018. But the problem is, I'm not at all optimistic. We don't know if there's going to be elections in 2018. Let's suppose that they don't, they fail for some reason. I don't think they will fail. They, uh, it is possible, it's not possible for some reason to prevent Lula from being a candidate. There's going to be parliamentarism in 2018. We're not going to vote for president. Something is going to happen. Right, right. You know, yeah. we are not in a democracy. We're in the in a process in a continuous coup. It continues. We don't know where it's going to stop. Right? It is going on. It's happening all the time. You know, and uh, and I don't think that we can be sure they are going to vote for a president according to what the constitution establishes in 2018. If Lula cannot be stopped. We will not vote for president in 2018. Write that down, please. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, I think we will vote because Lula, the same way Dilma was impeached without legal basis, Lula is going to have the kind of punishment which is necessary for him not to be able to run for president. Whatever he did that may be wrong or not, it will not matter. Uh, that's it. I think that's okay. Um, I'll try to be um, as brief as possible, um, and we can talk more afterwards. Um, I, I think one of the most classic statements that came out of um, uh, Jerema Veronique's mount is she said that it, it's a misunderstanding among white people, right? Um, there, you know, it's like it was branco si entending, right? Um, in this moment, so it's. I think she said basically is that social movements, you know, where that where black movements, feminist movements have been pushing in the past 13 years, they hadn't gotten there yet. 
and, and it becomes kind of this, this war of positioning among um, the elite and, you know, in terms of a particular kind of group of folks within the left itself that they had kind of ignored these, the further expansion um, of rights. And there were several examples that some of the interviewers gave around um, either kind of sexual education in schools, et cetera, um, that had been um, ignored, as well as even when, you know, asked questions or, or pushed to kind of expand the definition of genocide, to look into questions around the increased militarization and incarceration policies, um, et cetera. So people were very um, critical, but at the same time, um, really against what the, the, the possibility, other possibilities was, kind of a, a, a what's it called, a regression or a regression or a reversal of the, the gains of the past 13 years. On the one hand, people admitted that we're not where, we're not at the social justice project that we imagined, but we can't go backwards. Right? We can't go to what we, you know, we can't go back to what we had before. So that's really um, important. The other thing is that um, in terms of some of the critiques of the, the kind of internal critiques that came out is that a lot of folks emphasize this issue around the preparation of the masses, right? This idea that, um, that you had, um, you didn't, I mean, there was this group of folks, I mean, I should also emphasize that a lot of folks talk about affirmative action as pivotal to the transformation of the society. There you have a significant 40%, you know, universities now 40, some schools 50%, um, black and brown students, that you would have those groups be educated, but that there wouldn't be spaces opened up for them once they became educated, that this was gonna cause a problem. So that the question of you know, the unwillingness to relinquish white privilege, even um, in, within the left, became a problem. So if you look even at the government, well, how many black and brown people were there, really? Um, if you look at the ministries, how many black and brown people were there? In the ministries, so I think, and 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 women's questions kind of became, you know, jumped, you know, kind of trumped within, um, subsumed with racial equality, gender equality, indigenous rights, et cetera, et cetera. That how 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 significant were these issues really? So I think there was a lot of um, critique, but the unwillingness to kind of relinquish kind of racial um, kind of white privilege within the society as more black people were being um, educated, I think was a central question. I mean, it was really impressive how many people that we interviewed, the majority of whom were white, put affirmative action as a key kind of problem for the Brazilian society, that they had to undo this, right? Um, what were we gonna do um, with this population? So I think that's really important. So a population that was newly educated but did not have a space, I think was really not properly dealt with. Um, so how do you expand rights, but not, and then when they start to take advantage of those rights, what do you do with that population? So I think um, I'll just um, really end there, but I, the other thing I would want to say is that I got the impression during the time I was in Brazil that if, and I think the, 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 um, the survey shows <laughs> um, today, the research shows today, is that people basically said is that if they're in an election today and Lula was on the ticket, he would win. And hence, we see the, the criminalization process taking place currently. So I think that um, you know, there's a, um, a key sense that people haven't given up on the left, but it's precisely kind of you know, the, all of the, even the misogynistic, the kind of popular ways of, ways of doing politics that was very different, um, that people aren't willing, um, you know, that there's still, there's still faith, there's still optimism, but um, um, aren't willing to necessarily um, um, I don't know, I'll just end there. I don't know what my last thought is. But so I want to there. thank our panelists for being with us tonight. It was a really wonderful event. They deserve a round of applause. Thank you.